This morning we contemplate Christmas. Of all the religious holidays, Christmas, I think, I mean, it's my, my observation after many years of this, Christmas is the easiest for Unitarian Universalists to embrace and to get seriously behind. You use everywhere take delight in the simple joy and imaginative fancy of the season, the spirit of warmth and generosity it brings out in people, and the magic of the Christmas story. If you doubt me, just leaf through our hymnal. There are about 16 sections, different, or maybe 20 in here. And Christmas is by far the longest, has the most hymns uh, of all. Unitarian Universalists generally uh, draw back from Easter with its message of bodily resurrection. I'll try to uh, parse through that in a few months, but uh, most of us uh, recoil a bit, at least initially, and uh, don't get much more than intellectual stimulation from most of the other religious celebrations. But with Christmas, it's different. The rituals of trimming the tree, singing carols, and gift giving are indulged in by just about all of us. Even the myth of the first Noel is repeated to our children and thought about. This image of the baby Jesus lying in a manger while there was no room at the inn. By and large, Unitarian Universalists do not get all that wrapped up in myth or all that excited about Jesus. But we definitely like art and poetry and music, especially music. And as they all come together around Christmas, there's a tendency among us to willfully suspend our disbelief, if only for a season, and join in with the whole Christian world in celebrating the great prophet of Nazareth. It's kind of ironic that this would be uh, so for skeptics like ourselves, in that the nativity narratives in Matthew and Luke, and we did a whole little play about them last week, but these parts of the, of the Gospels um, from which the Christmas story is woven are clearly the least historical and the most mythical parts of the entire Jesus story. There's virtually nothing historical and nothing factual going on in those stories. And we don't need scholars to point out the anomalies of shepherds guiding their flocks in the middle of winter, which would not, never happen, or of oriental kings somehow penetrating the Praetorian Guard. I don't think so. With this morning's sermon, I'm completing my fourth month as your minister, and I suspect that you've begun to realize, yeah, I actually uh, take myth seriously and find it important. N now, the, the, the kind of um, conventional understanding is that myth equal primitive untruth. Uh-uh. <laughs> myth is not irrational, and it is not, is not rational, it is not irrational. I like to think of it as transrational. It's poetry. Poetry. All myths are imagery, as Alan Watts put it, an imagery with which we make sense of the world or ourselves. The imagistic Christmas story is about life and about reality just as assuredly as the theories of Albert Einstein and Max Planck, but using the picture language of poetry instead of using physics and mathematics. Both languages are valid. I'd hate to think that Unitarian Universalists were too closed-minded to accept the idea that two ways of looking at the world can both be equally true. <clears throat> it's kind of like the phenomenon of light. Physicists tell us that concerning light, the data can be explained in terms of light as particles, and also explained 
in terms of light as waves. The two explanations are equally valid. <clears throat> and further, one cannot understand the nature of light adequately unless they use both ways of looking at the data. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other words, although wave theory and particle theory are different explanations, they are not mutually exclusive. In order to understand light, one has to recognize light as sometimes best explained in terms of waves and sometimes best explained as particles. So by extension, let us say that sometimes reality can best be explained by means of scientific analysis and sometimes by myth. In this sense, they are both true. And in order to fully understand reality, one has to recognize the value of both approaches. One of the perennial problems <clears throat> with all myth is its tendency to become reified, etched in stone, killed really. A good myth is a living one, not a dead one. What makes a myth alive, basically, is its ability to affect us to draw us out and stimulate our imaginations. And by that standard, the Christmas myth is alive, as revealed by two key measures. First, the unbridled enthusiasm which so many of us, hardened skeptics included, have for this holiday. And second, the continued poetic elaboration of Christmas themes. Poets don't bother with ineffective uh, metaphors. T.S. Eliot and W.H. Auden and Cyril Connolly were on to something, you could say. There's a countervailing tendency for priests always and everywhere to lock up living mythologies and to canonize them and thereby control access to their healing and redemptive power. Now differentiating between the myth and the canon here is important. The myth is alive if it's a good one. The canon, which is the officially sanctioned rendering of the myth, is almost always dead or at least stiff and moribund. The canon is on paper, but the myth is happening everywhere right now. Each night a child is born is a holy night, writes the late, or wrote rather, the late Sophia Lyon Foz, legendary Unitarian RE curriculum director. Fathers and mothers sitting beside their children's cribs feel glory in the wondrous sight of a life beginning. They ask, when or how will this new life end? Or will it ever end? Each night a child is born is a holy night. And not only is the myth, all myth happening everywhere all the time in the same way as the second law of thermodynamics and relativity are happening everywhere simultaneously, all the different parts of the myth are happening at the same time. If you get focused, if you get hung up on the idea of Jesus' birth as being only something that once happened long ago in an obscure corner of the Roman Empire, then it seems to me that's all it ever can be for you. Moreover, you've missed the essence of the story. You've fallen under the influence of the canon and failed to wake up and see the myth all around you and inside you. You're missing the continuing revelation that it's happening right now, the living myth within us and in our midst. Once you start seeing mythically and poetically, everything starts to change. You suddenly realize <clears throat> that the virgin birth is happening all the time and that the deity is incarnate in everyone. How many unmarried 16-year-old girls gave birth last night in some tenement? or under a tree, or on a bed of straw because they didn't have money for a hospital bed. As Martin Luther pointed out over 450 years ago, people like to think that they would have let Mary and Joseph into their house. 
They think this because they know how important Jesus has become. But the truth is, had they been the innkeeper back in Bethlehem, they would not have let the poor indigents in. Why don't they let them in today? They have Christ in their neighbor. All the parts of the story are happening simultaneously. The hope of the world continues to be born anew in lowly places. Wise men and women continue to seek insight and connection to, with the essence of life and often go through great hardships to do so. Petty rulers still try to co-opt the wise and silence the prophetic. Once this is seen as all true and all happening now, we become free from knee-jerk obsequy to dead canonic forms and reborn, in a way, to the living miraculous world all around us. We link up internally with the wise and benevolent monarch within our hearts, within all hearts, seeking to sustain this insight, seeking, in the words of W.H. Auden, the poet, to discover how to be truthful, how to be living, and how to be loving. That is, how to be a truly human, human being. This is the reason that wise women and men still follow the Christmas star, and with its apprehension, still thankfully find themselves offering praise for the continuing miracle of life. In the words <clears throat> of the Unitarian E.E. E. Cummings, another poet, from Spiraling ecstatically this proud nowhere of earth's most prodigious night blossoms a newborn babe. Around him eyes, gifted with every keener appetite than mere unmiracle can quite appease, humbly in their imagined bodies kneel over time-space doom dream while floats the whole perhapsless mystery of paradise. Mind without soul may blast some universe to might have been and stop 10,000 stars, but not one heartbeat of this child, nor shall even prevail a million questionings against the silence of his mother's smile, whose only secret all creation sings. Once this apprehension of creation's continually miraculous virgin birth is felt and truly experienced, one begins to wonder, <clears throat> like the three kings of T.S. Eliot, were we led all this way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I'd seen birth and death, but had thought that they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We return to our palaces, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation. The pleasures and privileges of kinship are no longer quite enough. Ruling over others becomes secondary to connecting with them. And the simple means to make that connection has always and everywhere been the same as the grown-up Jesus, known mythically as the King of Kings, made very clear. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned and the sick. Such is the recipe for renewal and enlightenment and a vision of the holy as thought, sought by the three kings in Bethlehem and by the good king Wenceslas as well. These wise monarchs, like all mythological symbols, are alive inside us. We need not look to England's Prince Charles and hope for the day he becomes a modern-day Wenceslas. Look inside yourselves, around your very own neighborhoods. <clears throat> Rifling through my files while writing this sermon, I came across a haunting image which encapsulates, for me, this whole notion of seeking the enlightened moral monarch within and then, miraculously, beginning to see just the same right before our eyes. <coughs> it was over 80 years ago, 1936, that King Edward VIII was crowned in England. 
The city of London was filled with the high and mighty from all over the British Empire. Afterwards, when Alfred Dakin, Prime Minister of New Zealand at the time, arrived home, he was asked by news reporters what impressed him the most. He was thoughtful for a while, then he told how one night, while walking back to his lodgings from a state dinner, he saw something that had moved him deeply. In a dark alley of a slum section, he saw a boy about 12 years old sitting in a doorstep with his arm around a girl of about three. It was late at night and quite cool, Deacon explained. The boy had taken off his jacket and wrapped it around the shoulders of the little girl, and he had taken off his cap to cover her bare feet. Deacon said that he had traveled thousands of miles to witness a coronation. But the most kingly thing he saw issued from the heart of a little boy in a dark alley in a London slum. This Christmas, let us once again allow ourselves to become little children, that we may be open enough to recognize the beauty and wonder that abounds all around us, the divinity inside every person, and the suffering of the dispossessed in our midst reaching out for our care. And may we be noble enough to reach back, as children naturally do, and as the wise gratefully rediscover how to do, and to offer all our praise and all our love. Amen, and Merry Christmas.